Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to Rocket Summer in its waning days, an inaugural BookTube event created by Michael K. Vaughn uh, to celebrate, to get us all reading old science fiction, pre-1970 science fiction, uh, from the very beginnings through the decades as it grows, uh, all the way to the cutoff year of 1970. Uh, and I've been having a blast with Rocket Summer. I knew that I would enjoy it anyway, and I eagerly prepared for it for months ahead of time. Anytime I found an old work of science fiction that fit within the time frame, I would grab it, some old paperback or whatnot. I would, I would grab it, I'd throw it on a pile, and I would, I, was, I would wait. I wouldn't read it. I would wait until Rocket Summer. I read, I've read quite a few of those, but I also ended up surprising myself by reading a lot of canonical stuff uh, that I never found as mass market paperbacks that I had as e-books. Uh, and loving it. Going back to things like Stranger in a Strange Land or uh, Left Hand of Darkness was wonderful. It was absolutely wonderful. I saw a lot of stuff. I'm not sure. It's, uh, things like The Drowned Planet or The Drowned World or uh, Case of Conscience or... Uh, I'm not sure that I would have gone back to those books or when I would have done it. I certainly would have gone back to them in a science fiction mind frame. That's the nice thing about having a nice, popular, collected event is that you go into it feeling all all raised up by the enthusiasm. Uh, and I did so much of that revisiting canonical works that I felt a little guilty about ignoring all the 35 cent paperbacks that I had accumulated. So I went to one of those last time, uh, to an ace double, uh, which is, you've got one book on one side, then when you're done with it, you flip it over and you've got another book on the other side. And I read this thing, Bring Back Yesterday, uh, by A. Bertram Chandler, who's not a science fiction author that I know. Uh, and in yesterday's video, I mentioned uh, that maybe I would flip the book over and read the other novel, or that maybe I would go somewhere else and read something else last night. And <laughs> every once in a while, I leave my email on every video, and I get lots of responses to all, all kinds of things, strangest things in the world. Uh, every once in a while, though, I hit a nerve, and I never know when that's going to happen. Uh, and I hit a nerve with that question. I got bombarded with emails from people saying, what are you talking about? You don't read one half of a double novel. You read both. You flip it and read the other half. I don't know where you people were when I was in June on the Range a couple of years ago, and I think I read only one half of one of those books. I think one of my June on the Range ace doubles for Westerns, I still haven't read the second book, I'm pretty sure. But anyway, uh, I yielded, in this case, to Vox Populi and flipped it over and read The Trouble with Tycho by Clifford C. Mack, uh, who, unlike A. Bertram Chandler, is a science fiction author that I know and like. I've never read anything by Clifford C. Mack that I didn't like. Uh, it's entirely possible that, that uh, Clifford C. Mack, that this particular author, was the source of one of my long-standing uh, jokes <laughs> about the upper Midwest. <laughs> Any of you over the decades who've ever, ever uh, befriended me and you've been from the upper Midwest will remember that I often jokingly refer to wherever you come from as Minnetonka. And that's the reason. He's the reason why. But that, that, that's neither here nor there. That's a long story about a back room at a bookstore. So, but I, I have read a lot of Clifford C. Mack. I don't think that I had ever read The Trouble with Tycho before. Uh, so I read it last night. Short thing. Took no time at all to do. Uh, it's set in the future. It's the, the Tycho in question here is the Tycho Crater on, moon, on the moon, on Earth's moon. Uh, which is a, a remarkable feature. You can pull it into clear view with a good backyard telescope. Uh, it's a, it's old. Uh, as a, as it's an impact crater, and it's it's 100 million years old, and it's 15,000 feet deep. Uh, and in the storyline of this book, people do regularly go to the moon. They get sponsored to go there. Our character gets sponsored from. Uh, Clifford C. Mack's own hometown. They get, they get you can get sponsored to go to the moon. Uh, there are corporations that go to the moon. There are official space exploration ex expeditions that go to the moon. Uh, all for various purposes. For exploration, uh, to get away from it all, the frontier spirit, all the towns on, on the moon are given frontier town names. Uh, or to prospect for a number of different things. Uh, Clifford C. Mack says that that the, these prospectors can look for glass or lava deposits, volcanic glass, uh, and also microbes. There are microbes that have, I guess, a booming commercial realization back on Earth, and they, you can find them on the moon. And also little... Uh,
been a very active morning. That will not be the last time we get interrupted. It's been a very active morning. Uh, where was I? Oh yes, also little little energy dots that seem alive on the moon. You can, and you can go prospecting for any of those things. But the prospecting holy grail for all these towns within within you know lunar buggy distance of Tycho Crater, uh, the the holy grail for all of these towns is forbidden. Uh, as much by custom as it is by official edict, which is the crater itself. Because everybody, every time an expedition goes to the crater, it meets with a fatal mishap. It does not come back. Nobody comes back. So that starts all sorts of rumors. It starts all sorts of ideas about, well, what what could be the reason for that? Is, is, is there something alive down there? Is there something alive that's more dangerous than these little energy beings? Uh, that is, is there something that... I mean, it's, it's, an, it's an attractive prospect. All that equipment is down there, and it's all salvageable. Our main character in this book is, is a salvage rig operator, and he often thinks about Tycho Crater, and there's his, his eventual love interest also thinks about that. And so does the third character, the three main characters in this book. The third character is a scientist who wants to know all, as much as he can about the moon, and especially about Tycho Crater, about what's going on down there. And eventually, in the course of, the, it's a very, very short novel, in the course of the book, they all team up and go to explore Tycho Crater. And they all get something that they want, and all of them pay a price for it, although there is a happy ending. Clifford C. Mack gives us a very conventional happy ending. Uh, I don't know the history of this book lit at all. This is just a, no a novella. I, I don't know the history of it at all. I don't know whether it was printed uh, on its own first, or maybe in a Clifford C. Mack collection first. I believe he was a higher profile publisher, uh, published author than Ber A. Bertram Chandler. Or I, I could swear that I remember seeing a paperback of this thing by itself, not in an ace double, with a much better cover. This is a pretty good cover, but uh, with, uh, with a much better cover. I could swear that I remember that. Uh, maybe I got it confused with another Clifford C. Mack. I, I encounter him a lot in my used bookstore. And I don't think I have ever seen that other version of this since I had it. I had, if, I, if I'm right about it, I had this as a standalone novel in a paperback uh, a long time ago, and it's, it's long gone. I never see it. Uh, I, don't, I don't know whether or not this was ever repackaged as a standalone book, but I feel certain that Clifford C. Mack wrote it for commercial reasons. I think if you would ask him, he would probably say that he wrote everything for commercial reasons. Uh, but this is this often reaches a precipice in the story where it could either go off in decidedly non-commercial directions and just trust that your audience will come along with you, which is what you should do. It's what every author should do. Or you could at that at that precipice, you could then back up and go in a comfortable direction where you know that everyone will follow you and where you know that everyone will be glad with what you do. We are right about to read a whole month's worth of books like that. Uh, and that's what he does in this book. And he doesn't always do that. Uh, so I, I'm always interested in that. What happens when genre authors get to that precipice? The smarter ones, Clifford C. Mack was a very smart genre author. The smarter ones always know when they're at a crossroads. And they always know when they could go one direction or another. In, for instance, Samuel Delaney, you can watch him do it. In his books, you can watch him do it. And you know by chapter three which kind of Samuel Delaney book it's going to be. Is he going to go off the precipice into the unknown, which he often does, and those books are great, or is he not? Is he going to write something more conventional? Uh, and this, I wanted this to be so much more unconventional than it was. It has the basic building blocks. I don't, I don't want to be grandiose here, but the author was capable. It has the basic building blocks, the very same kind of basic building blocks, to make a sprawling novel like Dune. It really does. And it doesn't do that at all. It doesn't rationalize. It doesn't, it doesn't try that at all. Uh, and so I, that was a little disappointing. There are no characters here. Uh, the, the female, Amelia, is the closest that we get to a... The female character is the closest that we get to a character at all. The, the scientist guy is every gimmick in the book. It's, it's not meant to try you as a reader. Uh, and it certainly didn't try me. I just flew right through it. Uh, one thing that I noticed aside from that, it's very, very pleasant storytelling. So I flew through, I should say, I flew through it happily. 
I wasn't annoyed at all, like I was with the A. Bertram Chandler. I was, I, I flew through this happily. Uh, the one thing that, that really struck me is the thing about Rocket Summer that I've, I've brought up a few times this month, something that I call the science fiction Doppler shift, uh, where, uh, how to describe it? Uh, it takes place in some genres. It, it, like, for instance, let's pick a, a genre where it doesn't take place. Epic fantasy. There is no epic fantasy, epic fantasy Doppler shift at all. Uh, because an epic fantasy world is off by itself. It's not meant to be, it isn't positioned to be, it isn't described as being any kind of extrapolation of our own. It's a separate world than ours. Whereas a lot of science fiction is meant to be an extrapolation of our own. And that doesn't, whether or not an author extrapolates incorrectly is nothing to hold against them at all. There's no element in the storytelling. It, it, in fact, how well they extrapolate that future is a mark for or against their own creativity. So even if they're wrong, they could still be doing a great job. Uh, but nevertheless, when it comes to science fiction, the Doppler shift is really pronounced. Because, if, like I mentioned last time, if you have a character climbing around in, 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 in a character in 2041, climbing around in the steamy jungles of Venus, well, you as a reader, you just stop. You, you, you just stop. You, you say, all right, well, okay. So this is a novel of its time, and it can't stop being that. It can't stop being that for me. And the same thing is true here. This, uh, Clifford C. Mack wrote this book uh, I, not only before mankind went to the moon, but I'm pretty sure before John F. Kennedy even said they would. I'm pretty sure this came out. Uh, did, I, did, these, did the Ace Devils give you a publication date? 1961, yeah. So uh, the moon, I guess, was still an area of speculation. But you're reading this book and you're hitting the Doppler effect over and over again. Uh, there are no microbes on the surface of the moon. I doubt there are any microbes anywhere on the moon. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's no life on the moon, electric or otherwise. There's no bioelectric or otherwise. There's nothing like that. I... There's nothing deeply enigmatic and mysterious lying in wait at the bottom of Tycho Crater. Uh, and uh, maybe sadder of all, maybe the thing that bothered me as a NASA fan the most, uh, there are no uh, colonies on the moon. There should be by now. There should be. Long since by now. There should be a functioning colony on the moon. and There should have been one 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Uh, there isn't, and there won't be uh, any, at any point in the next century. There won't be. The United States is about to go into a long, long eclipse of science denial. Uh, so any chance that though, that, that ever had is not going to happen. Uh, so I, I was hitting the Doppler effect all over the place in this book. That's not Clifford C. Mack's fault. Uh, and all the things that he could do, you can't expect a writer to be right in prognostications. All the things that he could do, he does really well in this book. I, I really enjoyed it. It wasn't it wasn't I, occasionally in Rocket Summer. I have reread a book. This was not a reread. I don't think it was a reread, unless I read that standalone with the funny cover, with a great cover. Uh, but I don't know if I did or not. This didn't seem familiar to me at all. Uh, but occasionally in Rocket Summer, I have gone back to an older science fiction work that was a reread and been blown away by how much better it was than I have remembered it being. I don't think that's ever going to happen with this book. I don't think I'm ever going to read it again. Uh, but I, I enjoyed it very much. And, okay, for the Baying Mob, I finished the Ace Double, okay? <laughs> so kindly calm yourself. <laughs> so, so that's my report for Rocket Summer. We're just going to wrap up things tomorrow, and then we'll be done with July, which is astonishing in its own right. But we'll be done with Rocket Summer. Uh, so I'll wrap this up for now, and I will see you then. Thank you, Book Keith.